Well, joining us this week on Book TV from London is Stuart Lansley, who is an economist and he is a visiting fellow currently at the Townsend Center for International Poverty Research. Professor Lansley, what is the Townsend Center? The Townsend Center is an institution that is named after a very well-known British academic and expert in poverty called Peter Townsend, and he he started researching poverty in the post-war era in the 1950s and really reinvented the nature of poverty research. And he was probably the chief architect of uh, the idea that poverty is essentially a relative concept rather than an absolute concept. Um, and he, in fact, he died, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. And the center where he was working um, was sort of named after him. So it, it was, in fact, a sort of social policy institute, but has now become at the Townsend Poverty Centre, so I'm working part-time on poverty research at, at, at Bristol, at that centre, yes. And recently you published a book called The Cost of Inequality, Three Decades of the Super-Rich and the Economy. Are we living in a time of economic inequality, and is that important? We are indeed. I mean, the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor stands at uh, near historic levels. I mean, not just in the United Kingdom, but even more so in the United States and across the majority of the rich world. Um, these countries have been getting much more unequal um, since the 1970s. And in some countries, particularly the United Kingdom and the United States, and now back to the kind of income gaps we saw in the pre-war era. I mean, in the United, in the United Kingdom, it, we're back to sort of levels of inequality of the 1930s. And in the United States, we're back to levels of inequality of the 1920s. So this is a remarkable switch. Uh, we had this long period of equalization, um, the, the great leveling, as, as historians have defined it, in the post-war era to, to the mid-1970s. And then that whole process has gone into reverse over the last 30 years. We've simply, so we've simply gone backwards to, to where we were you know, 80, 90 years ago. Some would call that leveling redistribution. Some of it was redistribution, but it, the, the, the main driver of um, this process of equalization in the 1950s and 1960s was, in fact, a reformed economic system. Um, the, the, the model of capitalism that existed um, in the 1920s and 1930s, which was a very unequal model of capitalism, took on a very, very different form. So some of the things that drove that process of greater equality were higher taxes on the rich, a more profound uh, and effective welfare state. But a lot of it was to do with the way business organized itself. So what, what we have, and the, perhaps the most significant characteristic of the post-war capitalism was the fact that the, 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 the way in which the output of the economy was distributed between profits on the one hand and wages on the other was became much more equal. So the proceeds of growth were distributed much more evenly between the interests of business and the interests of the workforce. And I think that was the most, perhaps the most significant uh, driver of that process. And what's happened since the 1970s as that process has gone into reverse. So, you know, we, we've moved back to a system where the gains from growth have been increasingly colonized by big business on the one hand and by a small elite group of business and f businessmen and financiers on the other, while um, the rest of the pop working population have had, you know, except a, a smaller and smaller share of output. That's really what's been driving the changes, rather than a reverse in the process of redistribution. And is that a negative, that uh, profits have been emphasized? Well, uh, this, of course, is, is highly controversial. Um, and the, the, the economic orthodoxy of the last 30 years is that increasing the profit share would be a good thing for economies, that it would drive uh, uh, more entrepreneurialism, it would make uh, companies more efficient, and this would lead to a bigger cake from which everybody would gain. This is the sort of trickle-down theory, the idea if you, if you give more to a sort of handful of uh, particularly entrepreneurial business leaders, then everybody would benefit. Um, uh, but the evidence is that these theories have not worked out in practice. We, we've, what we've had, I think, is a kind of 30-year uh, experiment with economies. E essentially, uh, 
the American and the British economy in particular have been treated like a laboratory in which these theories have been tested. So we have, you know, we have now 100 years of data. You know, we have sort of 30 or 40 years when we had equalization. We've had 30 years when we've had the opposite. So we can look at the impact of these two periods on economic performance. And the evidence is that's that the latter, less equal model of capitalism has been less successful on every major indicator of economic performance compared with the post-war era. So we've had slower growth since 1980s. We've had lower productivity. We've had lower levels of business investment. And, and we've had higher levels of unemployment. And perhaps above all, we've had much more turbulent economies than the relative stability that we had in the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, on a cost-benefit analysis, you know, this period of unequal capitalism has basically, you know, has been a big failure. So the experiment has not worked. Who pushed the experiment in our two countries? Well, the experiment, um, the idea that, 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 that you should let, you should have freer markets and less state regulation, and as part of that, you should allow much higher rewards at the top and a bigger concentration of wealth at the top, uh, really came out of uh, a small group of uh, new right thinkers immediately after the war. Um, and, I mean, for, for 20 or 30 years, this is quite a small group, you know, maybe 10 people. Um, and these people basically were arguing for more markets, but they were more or less ignored. Um, and then during the crisis of the 1970s, um, their ideas started to become much more seriously taken. And their ideas were, although these ideas initially originated with the sort of new right, with people who believed in markets, the ideas became taken up by more centrist economists. And perhaps the most famous one is an American economist called Arthur O'Coon, who wrote a book called The Equality Efficiency Trade-Off, in which he argued that you, you, could, you could either have more efficient economies or you can have more equal economies, but you can't have both. And that idea was taken up uh, by Ronald Reagan in the United States and by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom, and they started putting in practice policies that would lead to more unequal societies. But gradually those ideas came to be accepted pretty well across the political spectrum, including, you know, by the, by the moderate left. So, you know, the, 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 the Democrats in the United States more or less bought into that idea. And New Labour, you know, sort of Prime Minister Tony Blair, effectively accepted that argument as well. And it's only really since the 2008 crash that that economic orthodoxy has started to be challenged. Well, uh, Stuart Lansley, one of the uh, themes in your book, The Cost of Inequality, Three Decades of the Super-Rich in the Economy, is that this inequality caused the 08 crash, correct? Yes. And how do you come to that conclusion? Well, I, I think that the, 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 the Basically, what, what, what happened in, in the 1980s and 90s is that more and more that, that we have this falling share of national output going to wages and this rising share going to profits and this concentration of income amongst a, this sort of tiny group of people at the top, maybe, maybe 10,000 people around the world uh, accumulating these huge sums of money. And what this does, this sort of imbalance, if you like, creates economic fault lines that eventually lead to collapse. And there are, there are two particular ones. The first is what happens to the demand in the economy. Because if you squeeze wages, and if wages start falling behind the level of output, there is a sort of demand gap. There isn't enough demand from consumers to keep consumer societies going. Uh, and indeed, if, 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 if those wage falls had been allowed to continue, then uh, economies would have imploded much sooner than 2008. So they had to be kept alive. And the way they were kept alive was by pumping in debt. And so what we had is between the sort of, you know, early 1990s and the mid 2000s, we had this great surge in the level of private debt in both the United States and the United Kingdom, rising to historic levels. And those sorts of levels of debt are unsustainable. Uh, and eventually they will explode. And the same thing happened, the, the, the reverse was happening at the top. So amongst the bulk 
of the workforce, maybe two thirds of the workforce, their, wa their wages were, were, were rising much more slowly than output, and therefore they.